Hey everybody, welcome to Lean Healthy Ageless. This is Dana Dimitri, co-author of the Eat, Lift, Drive Diet. With me, my good friend and the brilliant PhD in nutrition, Patty Milligan. Patty? Hi, you. glad to be with you all again. It's so good and you have so much wisdom on so many areas of health and of course with a huge focus on nutrition. But today I wanted to talk about a subject that's been coming up in our community, of course, serving women especially 45 plus, moving into 50s and 60s, we get the gnarly hand thing. We get the bigger knuckles, right? I mean, I feel like I'm pretty, look at this side. My right hand is especially gnarly. And um, I will say it is osteoarthritis. I, uh, For myself, I tend to lay down a little extra bone here and there. I have a little bump on my clavicle, you know, so I know we all differ, but I know women are concerned. And I will say that I am not at all an expert in osteoarthritis, but it is a common occurrence. And I know you know that there are many natural ways we can one maybe prevent it if we start early enough reduce definitely reduce the symptoms i don't know how much we can actually i don't know i'm going to have pretty hands again <laughs> but i do know that having the, the increasingly improved nutrition every single decade gets better i don't have the stiffness i used to have so while i may not have the pretty i do have pain function. free which i pain free and function so is that you know that's a good goal we, we can't all have 20 year old hands. Okay, so let me just let you take it away sure. on this subject. Sure, thank you for, for bringing this up because really, as, like you just said, we are renewing and regenerating every day. And yet we know the way that we are building back our body can t take a couple of twists and turns and that's where osteoarthritis falls into it. But it's actually autoimmune. Mm -hmm. And that becomes important to look at it in the sense that when we sit down and we look at our immune system as kind of a security system that runs in the background of our, of our body, we definitely know when it falls down because we get ill and we're hearing so much about building up the immune system, but it's a teeter totter. And the other side of it is we can have too active an immune system. And that's where we call things that are autoimmune, our immune system starts identifying everything as something that of one, we need to render it inactive, or we need to um, cease and desist, right? We need to get it out of the body. So osteoarthritis, I want you to think of three parts because um, it is a little bit like what you're experiencing, everything that you have done nutritionally. Some things work really well, some things you're not sure, mm -hmm. some things are supposed to because of research, but didn't do anything for you personally. And so one of these three areas, I want you to think about your own body and maybe your weakness, if you will. So the first is blood flow may mm -hmm. surprise you, but some people actually have more flare ups of osteoarthritis because the blood flow to that joint or that area has diminished. So let's park that because we'll talk more about that. Second is we know that everything is building, building up and breaking down. So when you said you naturally build up bone a little more than the rest of us, you have probably very active osteoclasts and your osteoblasts are the ones that are breaking down are falling behind, which in most sense you would go, yay, I'm gonna have strong bones, which obviously I think you do. You have so much that you're building bone in areas where we, we really wouldn't like that buildup. So we really need to understand your ratio of how, your, how we gotta clear out that signal to keep building, 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 and really emphasize how you clean out or break down, right? Wow. And then third, no surprise is the tissues that surround that area. How inflamed are they? Uh, which is a sign of, of course, autoimmune too, is if you are rushing the immune system in to help an injury, but they never get the signal to retract. I often think of firefighters, right? Firefighters are wonderful to rush in and take care of, whether it's a house fire or a brush fire, or whatever is needed, but we definitely want them to retract. We don't want to have water and, and pickaxes and all that to continue. Well, our immune system is no different. And in osteoarthritis, unfortunately, 
those firefighters are still on the scene and we want those to retract. So we want to address inflammation. What we still don't know from what I read in research is what are the triggers to turn on these genes? So we definitely know, and, and maybe you even want to comment, we do, definitely know there's a family history here. Um, there's definitely a genetic predisposition to certain things. So whether it's circulation in your family or whether it's, again, laying down more bone or, or not, uh, the opposite, osteoporosis, right? Losing bone too fast. Or if it's just your natural tendency is to be um, inflamed, that has a genetic composition. Um, I know with our Eat, Live, Thrive diet, Yes. Women that go consistently on, of course, you know, we don't eliminate all foods and all that, but we, when we do a basic elimination, even level one, which is, is grain-free and added sugar-free yes. women who go on that for three, yes. four weeks are amazed at how their joints in general to include their hands yes. do not feel so stiff. So yes. this is one of our areas of maybe number three tissues surrounding the inflammation around joints and so forth, or even within the joint itself. I think what's brilliant about what you created is you actually capture all three because we know most obvious is you are right. When tissues aren't puffy and inflamed, you're taking out the trash better, meaning that you're also having better circulation to those joints in those areas. And then the second is we definitely know when we're reju renewing and regenerating that the cells are in line with the body's, if you will, rhythm or good optimal health because they've gotten those good foods for building, then they don't produce all that additional waste. Mm -hmm. So it actually hits one, two and three, which is brilliant. Awesome. Okay. So what do you think, you know, for the most part, we're speaking to a community of women that right. are 45 plus they've, you know, what yes. they're probably in my phase or a little earlier where they're like, what am I going to do about this? Yeah. You know, I mean, we could talk prevention in twenties and thirties and realistically most 20 and 30 year olds are thinking about it, but yeah. um, what's the, the, the top couple things that you would suggest to all, I mean, yeah. Whether we actually show it or, or see it in our hands or whatever, um, as we age, our tendency toward inflammation and so forth is increasing. Right. So what are the top? Yeah. Great. And I like to do it one, two, three. Mm -hmm. And one is it'll go exactly to all the discussions you and Robin have had. We are so unaware at times, we're comfortably numb, I like to say, in what triggers our immune system to add additional inflammation. And I know you and I've talked about it first, or I mean before, but number one, would you believe, is our own self-talk. Mm -hmm. When we get fear-based and when we get self-deprecating, when we don't talk very nice to ourselves, that actually produces our cortisol levels to send, tell the body, hey, we might need those firefighters. And they don't know where they're going, but they get released. And so unfortunately, what happens is they settle in those small micro areas of our body. So first is to realize what are your triggers with stress? What are our, I know that the, it's not nutritional at this point, but we will get to that. It's That's just okay. so important how we, because it rides with us every single moment of every single day is what are the inputs we're putting into our body are we, again, being fearful? Are we saying, oh, we're not safe? We're not loved? All of that really affects the way the body is trying to protect you. And one of the protecting mechanisms truly is to turn on that immune system on high level, which is really what autoimmune is. Uh, second, go ahead. Did you want to? No, I was just going to say, I've never ceases to amaze me how God created us, yes. you know, body, soul, and spirit, how our thoughts yes. physiologically manifest themselves in our yes. body. Thank you. And, you know, we, we, you're not saying I have inflamed hands. You're saying I'm stressed. I, you know, yes. it just yes. matters living at peace internally, which is not an easy task. We're not saying we've got a handle on it. Exactly. We are all, this is, this is an assignment for every day yes. to take that deep breath to reset. I mean, of course we're both women of of Christian faith that just yes. know the source of all truth, you know, for us is God. Yes. And therefore we can find some peace even in the midst of chaos. Yes. Um, so no, thank you for bringing that up because it is crucial. 
Yeah, and I mean, one simple uh, task that in one of the, the faith-based centers that I do things with, say every time, you, yeah, when you get up in the morning, write down, I mean, of course, your prayer time is important, but also write down in that day, what are three possible triggers? Mm -hmm. So maybe it's dealing with a person at work that causes you ruckus. Maybe it's a family member that really ends up putting you in a spot that's not very comfortable. And maybe the third is you're headed to the bank and financially is something as a trigger. But by writing those down, then what you're going to do is you're gonna protect that situation and make sure you encapsulate it in prayer, encapsulate it in with a toolkit so that it doesn't penetrate longer than that 20 minutes you're involved in. And they really have identified, of course, now with all the stress that we're under and grief is one that goes on and on and on. And there are ways to encapsulate it, but to identify first and foremost, who triggers you or what triggers you in your life is so important. And I would imagine with your community, it may be walking into the kitchen, getting ready to prepare a meal for yourself or your family can be a trigger because you've been unsuccessful with weight or you're trying to manage something now. So at least call it for what it is and then be able to surround it with a toolkit for sure. Powerful to acknowledge our challenges and have just being mindful of them and having, even if it's, it's a work in progress, a plan like this instead, I'm gonna do this. Yes. If always trigger reaction, and you might not even know the reaction other than you feel stressed, which is yes. a pretty good sign of cortisol being released, <laughs> right? Um, but it's a yeah. new, you know, I, I've shared with our coaching community, I, I love positive self-talk, I love intentional living. So I have created several things in my life. When I put on my wedding ring, I ask God, to help me see my husband through his eyes and to love him in a way that brings God honor and makes yeah. him a better man. I put on my watch and I ask God, you know, to help me be live an intentional life. So I have these little triggers, Absolutely. these positive triggers to help yeah. me do it. But the point being, as you said, Patty, we all have things in, in most days that just they crop up again and again and again. And so if we can say, when that happens, then this is going to be my self-talk. This is going to be my little boundary. I can't 100% control it, but I can totally work on changing my response and how healing that is to the body is. Oh, it's so true. And I know you're probably, you know, your audience might be going, wait a minute. I thought I was going to be making notes on osteoarthritis. Well, you are because when again, like you just said, not to take it away from you, but we do have, we're a fork in the road. And if we want to trigger and react, just know that every time you do that, you are sending, like you say, mind, mind, body, and spirit, we're sending a signal to the body, we're under attack. Our body does three things when we're under attack. We send out the firefighters, that's the immune system. The second thing, we hunker down and we stop renewal and regeneration. So now you're breaking down everything, which adds to osteoarthritis. And third, you change blood flow. All of a sudden, blood flow doesn't contract into the center of the body, it goes to the extremities because we're hardwired to either run, fight, or freeze. And that's when you're doing that all day long, being triggered like that, that is not, that's a recipe for autoimmune or osteoarthritis if it's in your family for sure. Amazing. Yeah. Then the second is, which I love because Robin does such a great job talking about this, is we do not realize how many foods we eat our body is at battle with. <laughs> and it's not maybe an all out battle, but it's an irritant. I like to think of it as a thorn on a rose bush. So you may not realize coffee <laughs> is um, an irritant to you. You like it, it's ritual. And I'm not saying, you know, you invite whether or not you're going to take, take it out or not. But we do know in 45% of people, coffee is an irritant for osteoarthritis, mm. changes blood flow. It changes more of an environment where we have to neutralize the acidity, which now we're pulling from our delicious, you know, bones and tissues, these minerals that would like to stay there so that they can work on building bone properly, but also breaking down bone if we're speaking osteoarthritis. So I only mentioned that there's, you know, Robin does such a good job in your book of listing what are the top foods that are irritants? And all I say is 
go with a fresh mind. I, I often like to say, um, I don't know if you've done this before, but I'm working with teenage girls, you know, we all have a critter inside us that's very judgmental, <laughs> you know, and mine's Mabel. And <laughs> she always can find ways to, you know, make sure that I stay in my place in life. And so in some, some situations like this, pretend you're talking to Mabel as a friend and say, you know, Mabel, maybe it's time you start looking at your Starbucks and you want coffee and you like a cookie every day. Could that be an irritant that you're unaware of? Could you take that out of your diet? Or maybe actually chicken is something you thought you, would, you were raised on it. But what if you took a few days off? Would you notice a difference yes. in your joints? Because when the irritant is taken away, just like when you stop trimming rose bushes and you don't get nicked with thorns, you start healing. And so I really like um, the elimination. I really like a look at what foods that you've not considered could be something that's irritant. But I think there's a lot of little stuff because osteoarthritis is not going to go away in a day and it didn't come into a day. So I do think we have to look deeper. Well, and I know on our level three, I mean, level one is no grains, no added sugar. And that's a nice place to start because um, there are so many of the, the foods we're eating with grains anyway are packaged and so forth and have all sorts of other stuff too. Yeah. But when we go to level three, you know, we are taking out a lot of other things like nuts and dairy, just common, common yes. food sensitivities. And I really like to encourage people, if you're just feeling cruddy, I mean, we're talking about osteoarthritis today, but really autoimmune expresses itself so many ways with leaky gut, you know, osteoarthritis, huge things like lupus. You know, I mean, they're just, and MS is an autoimmune. Yes. I mean, so many, so many of these things are autoimmune, not like on steroids, but I do feel like if people can do our level three, that's a lot more intense, but even for, you know, 10 to 14 days, they can get a sense of what it feels like to have these common food sensitivity foods out. Now they're not sensitive to all of them, but we're not looking at, you know, specific fruits and vegetables. And we do know some people have issues with FODMAPs. We do know, I've read over the years that some people with arthritis, types of arthritis, it is the nightshades and yes. things like that. So could you address maybe for this particular um, subject of osteoarthritis, if yes. someone were gonna do an elimination diet, would there be a few foods that, that are common challenges on this particular subject? Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. And what we now know, kind of staying with the theme of osteoarthritis, when we look at why the joints want to build up, if you will, it's a protective mechanism of the body. And part of that is we suspect as it relates to food that we don't have the enzymes to break down whatever food we're eating to all of its parts. So that again, it's kind of like going to a carpenter's office. You have all the individual building blocks that we build good tissue, good bone back. What happens is we start absorbing already the plank <laughs> or a, a wedge joint. Uh, and what happens is that's when our body goes, whoa, I got to protect myself here. This is coming down the path. It's too many pieces together. I don't know what to do with it. I'm going to pack on additional bone or I'm going to flame this area up so that none of that can come in and cause more damage. So if mm. we look at it in that way, then the foods that we suspect uh, really are at highest risk for not appropriate enzymes, mm -hmm. it is dairy. 40% um, mm. of the world actually don't have a good enzyme bath to mm. digest dairy. And it's funny because we wanna say it's lactose, right? Which is the sugar in dairy. But worldwide, it's actually the protein in dairy. It's casein. Yes. So I would say that that's one where the enzymes we know is very genetic. And it's very heritage related, depending on what area of the world you were raised uh, or, or that your lineage is from. No surprise, you can imagine, Asian population is not high on the dairy enzyme. Now, again, we don't want to be broad blanket. Uh, some people do with Asian descent, but the majority don't really do well with that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, second is in that category, which again may surprise people, is citrus. 
citrus. And again, I don't want to ever paint be a nutritionist that kicks any healthy food out of the family. But all I'm saying is if you are one of these gals that routinely have a grapefruit or a glass of orange juice or doing something, you know, lemon or lime, which you and I are big proponents of. Uh, and now you're thinking like, wow, I do that all the time. I never thought. And it might be worthwhile because within three days, I, I, and again, you know, Robin's expertise is probably and yours um, in how fast elimination can work. But I know when it's an enzyme issue, it's very dramatic and very fast, okay. right? And then the third is surprisingly, um, it's wheat, but it, it, it's not because of the gluten, I always like to say, which is so strange. It's um, actually because there's two preservatives that um, we just don't, uh, you know, they're dough extenders in the US um, and our body just doesn't have the enzyme to break it down. Now, most of us, to be honest, causes a little bit of an immune response. We render it inactive and we poo it out. But in those that that enzyme really causes that cascade of autoimmune, those are the ones to watch for. So Patty, if someone were to want to have some occasional wheat products, yes, um, I've always recommended, for example, for pasta, finding uh, imported from Italy, not made in Italy, I should say. I mean, not just an Italian company with an Italian name on the outside of the box. <laughs> but actually, yeah. fatto in Italia. Um, yeah. So is that still- Absolutely. I mean, you know, dramatically, right? We actually know that celiac sprue as a diagnosed disease is actually autoimmune. Mm -hmm. And I would, when I was counseling, you know, people that were in um, celiac sprue, I was always amazed. They'd go over to Europe. Well, I wouldn't know. They'd go over to Europe, they'd come back and then they'd snicker in the office and go, you wouldn't believe I had a croissant in France. I had pasta in Italy. I had no symptoms. And that's what really told me, you are so right. There is something we do. And I understand we also in this country, chlor by law, and it's done in a good sense because we don't want an infiltration of microbes, but that we chlorine flush all pipes related to wheat manufacturing, which again, makes sense on the outside. The only thing, as you well know, chlorine is such an irritant, such an inflammatory mineral that was never supposed to last in our body at all. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. I'd like to go back to my three things to give kind of one or two remedies for each. So okay. when we talk about blood flow, right? So we're trying to make sure, remember, blood is coming in, bringing nutrient rich and oxygen to all of our tissues, right? But it's also a trash collector and it pulls trash out of the body. And that's where I, I think most of the thought leaders are saying breaks down in osteoarthritis. We don't take out the trash very well from our cells. Part of that's blood flow. So the two things, and I know there are things you're big proponents of, what can we do to increase? One is move, <laughs> is get movement in if you wanna call it exercise, but probably the most strongest evidence is a bouncer. Mm -hmm. or a mini trampoline, because it pulsates the movement of our blood and our tissues love being massaged that way. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way to remove um, our dead waste product, quite frankly. So make sure that you're doing that. And certainly if you suffer from osteoarthritis, I might upregulate that. I might say, I'm going to be very purposeful and I'm going to get more movement in and or use my mini trampoline once or twice a day and see if my symptoms improve. Cause then you can definitely point that, um, you know, blood flow is an issue. Second is unsweetened cranberry juice, oh. beetroot, beetroot juice, and upping your nitric oxide food sources, <laughs> which yes. is a mouthful because, um, and I'd love your experience with what you have seen Dana with your work, but we definitely know that we travel with a lot of nutrients in our blood, not just oxygen and vitamin C as I think right now we are thinking about, but mm -hmm. one of the powerful one is nitric oxide, which tells our blood vessels, they communicate through, you know, kind of a whisper through a text, Hey, mm -hmm. stay open, stay flexible, you know, keep flowing. And, um, osteoarthritis patients would, um, really benefit from that. Here's a supplement <laughs> that I'll, I'll share in the notes uh, that Patty turned me on to. It is a nitric oxide 
supplement and I have the strips to measure if I'm low, average, or optimal, you want to be optimal. And so this is just a little tablet you can take every day. And um, yeah, I had been doing the nitric oxide workouts for quite a few months. And my my original, before I took these at all, was um, in a decent medium zone, not optimal, quite optimal. So I, um, I just, I'm learning more and more about the power of nitric oxide for cardiovascular health. In this case, cardiovascular health lends to less inflammation in the body because it can get the garbage out. So I love that, Patty, you always make, like we can have these word pictures versus just memorizing how all these yes. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, remembering when the blood is flowing, you yeah. know, nourishment's going to the cells in the form of the things that we hopefully good stuff we put in, but also garbage is getting taken out. It's a powerful yeah. thing. So, um, but I know the nitric oxide workout can help because uh, I'm all about doing some of the natural stuff, but um, what are some of the highest foods in nitric oxide? Yeah. And this is, you know, this will, again, I love it when it focuses on color, right? Yeah. Things that are deep crimson red. So mm. that's where beetroot that comes dark, um, cherries that uh, talks about eggplant, even though it's purple, it's also a great source and things that are deep green. So mm -hmm. our arugula and our spinach and our collard greens for you in the South, we can whip through all dandelion greens, even parsley, uh, basil, rosemary, all of those use those liberally because they're all increments of adding for nitric oxide. Nice, nice. Yeah. And then, so, yeah, so that's for blood flow and circulation. Second is what we touched on, which is how do we make sure that we make just enough of the building of the joint tissue and the bones, but not over, right? So that we're causing those osteoblasts to keep building, 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 because I also have that issue. But I understand we want to help the body realize it can build up, but it should tear down. And in that sense, that's a good full spectrum mineral bath. In other words, we, you and I, we are storing and building up more calcium on top of calcium in those particular areas. And I know we get the idea that that's so good, but probably just like also Dr. Mark Stengler talks a lot about, there's 72 different minerals that we want in our diet. So what we can do with that, and, and I know you're a proponent of it because you sell it, just making sure that we have good sources of full minerals and that we're very conscious of um, not, you know, again, not taking excess supplements that would be just calcium related. Uh, this is the one that I think we don't understand why the bone wants to stay in place versus break down. It's probably the least available for nutrition implications unless you don't have good mineral bath. Try to think that whenever you're eating and drink, you want well water. You want a situation where you are mimicking um, how we lived on the land way back in Jesus's days or <laughs> even we don't get well water because most of us are you know we're drinking purified bottled water because we have to we're trying not to drink our tap water because it's full right. of you know arsenic and, <laughs> uh, and fluoride but but then we're we're drinking for the most part stripped water and right. I do want to ask you a question I we we sell and in, in encourage our audiences to put the um, trace minerals, concentrates the brand into their water. I mean, yes. you don't want to be drinking out of plastic all the time. So yes, yes, convenience at the airport and things like that, you're going to have plastic sometimes, but you want to be um, yes. putting your filtered water, um, hopefully from a filter from your home, mm -hmm. if you can, um, into your, your, your flask or whatever, and then replacing those minerals. But question for you, Patty, on this subject, because I yeah. haven't asked you this, all these smart waters and um, alkaline waters, how do we even, are, first of all, are they mineralized? Just because they say smart or alkaline, are they mineralized? And two, you know, which ones, if any, are worth that extra money? Thank you. Great question. And I'm going to, again, lean on some of the experts. Um, Gina Bria runs a, for, a, a nonprofit that's called the Hydration uh, Summit. And her website is, I think, actually hydration.org. 
And so I'll take her information. And what she says, remember the reason, again, we want well water, or just as you mentioned, we want to make sure water doesn't carry residue of plastics, doesn't carry chlorine or fluoride or things that we definitely know in research has been shown that our body doesn't like, cause about hyper uh, inflammation. But what we want to do is we want to have that electrical charge mm -hmm. from the water. So if you go from that, unfortunately, all those waters don't have that. <laughs> and I hate to say it because I would love to be able to grab off the shelf something that would work. But what she says is it just can't survive manufacturing. And in many of the cases, they're also in plastic bottles. It might be a higher quality plastic bottle, but still it's not doing what we think. So doing the recommendation, which adding drops of trace minerals, mm -hmm. Also making sure that you're choosing foods. This is kind of new information for me in the last couple of years is choosing foods that are high water content, but please know it's not just water. The magic is they contain a matrix of minerals that are holding that water gel-like, which our body loves, and that's electrically charged. So the top four categories of foods for that are mm -hmm. Anything that is grown right on the soil, like garlic and ginger and onion. Ooh, our body loves to take those in because that's a type of water that our body recognizes as a, as a good friend of the family. <laughs> and they welcome them in. Second is fruits and vegetables that are high in water. No yeah. surprise, we're pushing fruits and vegetables again. But um, it turns out, I always love this because in the, in the fruit family, I'm thinking dried apricots or a banana not how high water, they seem dense to me. They have 78 and 82% water. Wow. So certainly we know cantaloupe and watermelon and oranges uh, um, you know, are high in water, but don't throw anything out because even dense fruits are high in that gelatinous water that our body loves. Vegetables, same thing, all vegetables. So even if you think, oh, how big of a deal can it be if I grade, you know, a little rosemary onto my potatoes or my vegetables or include in my salad a little bit of cilantro or parsley. Please know you're activating the energy, the electrical charge in minerals that are contained in those kind of plant-based foods. Mm, in fact, I'm going to say that soon there'll be a book out that says we're not eating plant plant-based diet because of the nutrients that, you know, you and I are so familiar with we're eating them because of the electrical charge mm. that our body resonates with. And then, then the third category is to make sure that you just stay hydrated where you do either, again, fruit infused water, trace minerals, uh, or using things like cactus water. Now I'm in the desert, so I can say that out loud because cactus water is now overtaking coconut water on the shelf. But really, and aloe vera juice, all of those items have that type of water that have an electrical charge that our body likes. We're not asking you to overhaul your whole life or go live like a monk. But what we are saying is frequency and habituation. So what are the things that you're doing more often that if you just tweaked one of them or maybe eliminated, what kind of impact would that do on your health? Yeah. And it can be big things. Yeah. Good, good, yeah. excellent. And, and it does all these things that can help osteoarthritis help everything else too. <laughs> exactly. I mean, because exactly. it's just, and we all, you know, so if, if you're listening, but that's not your, you know, number top of top yeah. three of your health concerns, the truth of the matter is it can help. It can probably address a lot of those too. Well, and it's funny because, you know, again, in the miraculous way that God created us, it really is the red thread. So, uh, and again, listening to thought leaders, it really Alzheimer's memory loss is nothing different than we are depositing things in the brain tissue that we're not meant to be. Osteoarthritis, we're depositing things in the joint that we're never being. Cardiovascular disease, we're depositing you know, and it's way more than just fat in our arteries. We're depositing band-aids, quote unquote, uh, that we're not meant to be. So all, like you say, all of these things are just whatever your genetic predisposition is 
that an organ or a part of your body is maybe more at risk, but it's all the red thread. Yeah, I love it. Patty, you just always make it so fun and interesting. And I think motivating because when you can see in a word picture what your body's doing at the cellular level and what and how much power you have and your thoughts, as you said, how we talk to ourselves, how we think, how we manage our stress in our choices, you know, in the movement choices, in the nutrition choices. It's, it's very exciting because you now it's not so ambiguous. He's like, I have a lot of power and control in here um, to really make a difference in my health and, and to minimize many of the negative symptoms greatly, yes. um, greatly. So thank you always for just making it fun to want to be healthier. <laughs> Great. Yes. You bet. Um, in closing, do you have any specific supplements at all? I know you said everybody's different, but people yeah. talk about chondroitin and glucosamine. Yes. Do you have any words of wisdom on that subject? Because I know I'll probably get asked it if I don't sure. ask you. <laughs> exactly. And you are so right. It sounds like, you know, it's a bit of a there aren't good tests to know what you're low in, honestly, but I'd say the two that some of the doctors I work that really routinely see a big difference is, um, interestingly enough, if you're already in the throes of osteoarthritis, it's actually taking what they call proteolytic enzymes, which is a very, excuse me, very big word, but it just means that you're offering the body additional protein enzymes. Here's the interesting part. And I know, again, you can speak from personal experience with this. We don't want the protein enzymes to go with your meal, unless your doctor has prescribed that. We want the protein enzymes to go between your meal because we want to signal your body to chew up extra tissue, extra protein that's starting to form around your joints. So that's probably one. Second is I understand that when you get a multi-combination joint formula, it's probably best. So mm -hmm. you're getting one that has glucosamine, chondroitin, MSM uh, is, are probably the ones to start with mm -hmm. and to make sure that your omega-3 intake is adequate because that's natural flame retardant for that. And then beyond that, it's really working with your doctor to understand what his expertise is. Or, you know, if, and I know you have so many different great colleagues that you follow, but one of the ones that I really find, um, Dr. Josh, at, Josh Axe, mm -hmm. uh, I think has some really good information. Dr. Mark Stengler, uh, that you can find online specifically for joint health, and they'll kind of go through some of the, some yeah. of the factors there as well. Excellent. Well, we yeah. never want to just put a pill on things, even if it's a healthy natural <laughs> supplement. That's exactly. there's so much more we can do. It can be a help, yeah. but but if we're taking that supplement, thinking it's going to uh, take the place of good healthy lifestyle choices, yeah. we're not going to get the kind of results we're really looking for. Probably, you are so right. And well, I think I go back to Hippocrates and some of the the great ancients. You know, it really is full body you know, looking at mind, body, and soul. And they used to counsel patients like that. Well, today, good reminders. God bless you, Patty. Thank you again for just sharing your depth of knowledge that is, I can't even imagine. I've, I've talked so many subjects with you and you're always <laughs> so much. God bless everybody. Stay healthy and put a few of these things into practice. <laughs>